Hello friends, welcome back to Dig It With Raven. Here we are chatting again about another archeological dating method. Isn't it exciting? Maybe? This is the video where I'm actually going to be making a sandwich. And I've had many a men from this channel tell me to go and make them a sandwich. So this is how I'm gonna do it. And if you're a little confused, stick around and you'll see how that comes into play. I'm really trying to get through as many dating methods as possible so that the series is very well-rounded and can be the ultimate study tool. Regular dating methods, on the other hand, yeah, let's just talk about archeological dating because I'm actually decent at explaining that. Today we're resetting more radioactive clocks and talking about potassium argon dating. This method is a little different from the other ones we've talked about because with potassium argon dating, we aren't directly dating artifacts. Nope, we're dating rocks. When I put it that way, it sounds like you have a weird relationship with a pet rock. Hmm. Anyways, let's get into the science. Potassium argon dating is similar to carbon-14 dating because it uses radioactive decay. It measures the rate of change from an unstable isotope to a stable one. And if you're wondering what an isotope is, check out my video on carbon-14 dating. I do a whole spiel on it over there. Potassium has three naturally occurring isotopes. Potassium-39, which makes up about 93.258% of all potassium in the world. There's potassium-40, which makes up 0.01 117% and there's potassium 41 which makes up the remaining 6.7302% and of course because archaeology is never easy the isotope that we need the unstable isotope that makes potassium argon dating possible is potassium 40 the rarest of them all and now I'm sounding like a Disney movie Potassium-40 is an unstable isotope. It has an extra neutron and it doesn't like this squatter hanging out in its nucleus. So just like with carbon-14, potassium-40 wants to be stable again. And this all happens through radioactive decay. And something cool comes out of this fam. Potassium-40 shows up in forms of volcanic rock, igneous rock if we're getting technical. And how do volcanic rocks form? volcanic eruptions. So here's the story of volcanic rocks. One, volcano erupts. Two, lava and other hot volcanic materials spew out from the eruption. And three, all the volcanic snot just cools and hardens, making igneous rock. This can also happen underground without any of this spewing, but I'm talking about the snot rockets that come out of volcanoes for this video, okay? Now can we guess what's inside volcanic rock? If you said potassium-40, you are correct. Now we bring half-life into the equation. Potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.25 billion years, which is a lot longer than carbon-14. But what happens is that over the years, the potassium-40 decays into one of two separate elements, argon-40 or calcium-40. And it decays into these two elements at a constant ratio. 89% of potassium-40 decays into calcium-40 and 11% turn into argon-40. And we're looking for the argon. Argon is a noble gas. It's inert. It's what all gases hope to be when they grow up. It's one of the most stable elements, which is very attractive to the unstable potassium-40. Think of it like potassium-40 having daddy issues and has finally come to terms with them and is now very much craving a much more stable relationship with others and themselves. It's a real moment of growth for potassium-40. Now there is technically argon in volcanic material. But when everything is in its hot liquid lava state, the argon, as it's so stable, doesn't actually form any bonds with anything that is in there, and it's therefore free to just bubble out. That means when everything is cooled and igneous rock is formed, the argon levels are set to zero. All of the argon that we find in igneous rock is then therefore the product of potassium-40 decay. And we can use this ratio of argon-40 to potassium-40 to tell us when the rock was formed. Like, oh, 
Oh, how crazy is that? Did you ever think that you could be able to figure out when a rock was made? If you're a geologist, that answer is obviously yes, but let's just marvel at the feats of science here for a second, please. And you might ask, why don't we just use the calcium 40, seeing as there's more of it? Great question. The thing is, calcium 40 doesn't seep out like argon does, so there's no base zero point for us to use as a dating method. We use a mass spectrometer, just like with carbon 14 dating, to measure the ratio of argon to potassium 40. And then there's a lot of math and calibration and such, and that's how we get our date. So the more argon trapped in the rock, the older it is. We don't need a lot of the rock either, only about 10 grams. When I say not a lot, I'm talking in relationship to the rock and not in comparison to artifacts because 10 grams of an artifact can be quite a sizable chunk and not very ethical for dating. Rocks, on the other hand, are much more expendable than archeological artifacts. And just a quick note, I am including stone buildings in my artifact list, but stone buildings aren't relevant to this dating method anyways, because they're, they're too new. Now you're probably thinking, great, we can date volcanic rocks, but what does this actually have to do with archeology? span Well, a lot of important sites for the study of early humans and hominid evolution are located in areas of volcanic activity. For example, the Rift Valley in East Africa. The Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania is probably the most famous area that you might have heard of. These remains being found in volcanic areas means that we can use something called sandwich dating, which looks a little something like this. Let's say a volcano erupted and formed a layer of volcanic rock represented here by this piece of bread. Then life goes on in the area. Things grow, animals and early hominids interact with the area, like this peanut butter and flax here. Then boom, an early human dies right here, which is represented by this banana, which I think is very fitting because bananas are full of potassium. These human remains get buried, turned into bones and fossils, and then a few million years later, bam, another volcano eruption happens and covers the entire area, thus creating a pretty tasty sandwich, if I do say so myself. This means that we have two layers of datable volcanic rock sandwiching archaeological material. This is really great for material that we can't date with other methods like carbon-14. Carbon-14 is only good for dating objects from up to 50,000 years ago, whereas potassium-argon dating can date volcanic rock from 100,000 years ago to 5 million years ago. That's why it's so important for dating fossils and early hominids. Primates started walking upright about 4 million years ago, so you can see how much of hominid evolution we can cover with potassium-argon dating. As I said earlier, potassium-argon dating is very useful for early human sites in East Africa, like the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. In that gorge, we found evidence for Australopithecus paranthropus boise, and I probably messed it up, Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Olduvai Gorge is a volcanic area, and its two million year history has been dated using potassium argon and argon argon methods on its deposits of hardened volcanic ash called tuff and other materials between archaeological remains. You might have noticed that I just mentioned a second, similar sounding method as well argon argon dating. The full name of this is laser fusion argon argon dating, and it's been used on sites like the Olduvai Gorge. This method is much more sensitive and requires only a super tiny sample to complete. Literally, sometimes you only need to extract a single crystal from the pumice. What they do with this is convert stable isotopes of potassium, potassium-39, which is the most common one, to argon-39 by neutron bombardments. Pew, pew, pew. They then measure the argon-39 and argon-40 isotopes in the sample using a mass spectrometer after they release the gases by laser fusion. Everything I just said sounded like it was coming out of a Star Trek episode, but this is real science, you guys. As the ratio of potassium-39 to potassium-40 in a rock is always the same, the age of the rock can be determined based on its argon-39 and argon-40 ratio, meaning the more argon-40 in comparison to the normal ratio, the older the sample. Just like every dating method though, potassium argon and argon argon dating do have their limits. With the dates, there's always an error margin that comes along with it, like a, a plus or minus X amount of years. For example, tough stone at the Olduvai Gorge has been measured to 1.79 plus or minus 0.03 million years ago. That's about an error range of 30,000 years, which seems like a big gap in time, but it's only 2% of the total age. It's rarely possible to get 
get an accuracy better than plus or minus 10%, but that's still not the worst when we're talking about millions of years, right? Don't forget that we can only date volcanic rock with this, so we are limited to the types of materials and the sites that we can use this on. Nevertheless, potassium argon dating is definitely a valuable dating method when volcanic rock is around. So that is potassium argon dating, and now I have a really delicious sandwich to eat that I made for myself and no one else. So if you like that video, go ahead and smash that like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on any other videos. And if you want the whole playlist of my archeology span dating method series, go ahead and click the playlist in my link in the description and in the pinned comment. Also, if you wanna support the channel and help fund making me more sandwiches and making more videos like this, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. You get early access to all of my videos and you might even get your name on the screen right here as a supporter. Here are all of my socials and as always, stay dirty, my friends. Mm. That's good.